Bashar has no choice. He's going to have to face these two bloodthirsty brutes. For this young Cro-Magnon, it's a matter of life and death. Because he's lived through humiliation, gone beyond his limits. Because he's taken all the risks, faced all the dangers, and... Because the spirits are with him, there's no turning back. He must fight for his mother. For those in his clan, for those he loves. Yelene, I'll find you. Tashar's honor is at stake. The moment of truth is at hand. This incredible story takes place 20,000 years ago. We are in the south of France, and life is in full swing in this Cro-Magnon encampment. Cro-Magnon is a funny little nickname. It comes from Monsieur Magnon's cave. Scientifically speaking, it's more accurate to speak of Homo sapiens. When his first skeletons were discovered at the end of the 19th century, they were named after the place where they were found. We use it for modern humans, the Homo sapiens of Western Europe, roughly dated between 40,000 years and 10,000 years BC. Tashar is a young man of 15. He divides his time between his mother, Lati, and age-appropriate activities. Within his clan, he leads a gentle, carefree life. I don't know if it's good to live in a Cro-Magnon tribe 20,000 years ago. What is certain is that we're dealing with small groups of individuals who, who know nature extremely well, where everyone knows exactly what they have to do to ensure the group's survival. In a group, there must be enough fit hunters to bring in meat, enough women to gather food and give birth, enough elders to pass on knowledge to the younger generation, enough children to make the group sustainable. As the day passes peacefully at the camp a few kilometers away, another member of the Tashar clan is gathering fragrant herbs for dinner. Suddenly, noises attract his attention. In the valley, another group of Cro-Magnons is slowly advancing. The man is both surprised and a little worried. The clans lived widely scattered, so there was little chance of them crossing paths. The entire Cité de l'Europe was home to between 30,000 years and 200,000 inhabitants, which is extremely small since it's the equivalent of a city like Le Havre. Le Havre, for example, or Reims? Who are these foreigners? What do they want? The picker notices that they're heavily laden. Clearly, they're moving around with their tents, but they're heading in the direction of the camp. The men were nomadic, i.e. they had an encampment and could move with the seasons, for example, to track game. That Cro-Magnon man would have lived in a cave, confined to the bottom of this little hole, is a completely false image. The spotter must quickly warn the other members of the clan. The news hit like a bomb. For Tashar, it's a first. He has never met anyone other than members of his tribe. His curiosity is stronger than anything else. When you meet members of a clan other than your own, 
You don't know who you're dealing with. Are they going to be violent, belligerent, out to get you? To imagine prehistoric man as an ecologist, a pacifist, living in peace with one another is perhaps a little excessive. At 15, Tashar is still naive. He doesn't see the potential danger posed by these strangers. Fortunately, his mother keeps a watchful eye on him and forces him to take shelter. There's a good reason why she's so protective. Of the three children, Tasha is the only one she has managed to keep alive. In the midst of all the commotion, a man of imposing stature is struggling. Jalig is something of a clan leader, and he gives the orders. In all human groups, there's always a leader who emerges because he's earned the respect of others in that position. There's little evidence of this. What we do know is that some families may have been more powerful than others. As the visitors approach the camp, everyone is on their guard. The atmosphere is electric. On the face of it, Cro-Magnon was not a warrior, a conqueror who wanted to see his neighbor's territory. We can imagine that on both sides, limiting aggression is the best survival strategy when two clans meet. A heavy silence has settled over the camp. The two clans observe and judge each other. Each spies the other's reactions and tries to guess their intentions. The Cro-Magnons weren't savages incapable of controlling their impulses, the violence that could inhabit them. They were people who tried to live as peacefully as possible. Chalik sensed no aggression in his visitors, so he trusts his instincts. Everyone seems relieved. Tensions are down a notch. Chalig invites the strangers to sit around the fire as a sign of welcome. Within minutes, a strange ritual begins. Objects of all kinds are passed from hand to hand. Each one weighs, inspects, and comments. When two clans met, bartering took place. These events were an opportunity to exchange goods such as jewelry and hunting weapons. In the course of their many travels, the members of the Tasha clan amassed a veritable treasure trove. By showing all these precious objects to his guests, Chaleg is surely trying to impress. Of course, there's a lot to trade. You can see that there are materials and objects that have traveled. For example, the shells collected on the Atlantic or Mediterranean coasts are sometimes found in archaeological sites far away. These objects would have passed from hand to hand, from one group to another, which is quite likely. Tashar is overwhelmed. He's never been to a bartering session. He'd really like to take part. But it's for adults only. Chaleg has a very specific idea in mind. He absolutely wants to exchange his precious objects for women. Last winter, two of the clan's women died. We need to replace at least one of them. It's a question of survival for the group. But he's only really interested in the youngest. Women are exchanged, children are exchanged, simply to regenerate the group's vital forces. We need to be able to have women to give birth to children. We need children to ensure the group's future. The negotiation is tight. Chaleg shows no signs of impatience. He absolutely must convince the other clan to give him this woman. 
When there were problems with epidemics or infant mortality, women had to be shared between groups and this was vital. Chaleg decided to make a final offer. After a brief hesitation, he accepted. Now he must refer the matter to Talu, the shaman. Talu agrees with Chaleg. The young woman will join the community. It's not hard to imagine that exchanging women was a way of crossbreeding the population a little to renew the gene pool and perhaps produce healthier children. It was all very, very intuitive. Later, Tashar and his mother, Lati, are appointed by Chaleg to welcome the young woman. They are very proud. The newcomer's name is Yaleen. Tasha tries to reassure her. He's there to look after her. For the first time, he has been entrusted with an important responsibility. Lati is also happy and proud of this decision. Chaleg's decision is a great vote of confidence in her. Although Tasha and Lottie have to squeeze into their tent, they welcome Yaleen. This way, they can keep an eye on her. This little group will have to get organized inside the tent. It's not very big. They had to accommodate two or three people with a fire in the middle or at the entrance to this little hut. We also know from archaeological evidence that the interior was organized to be much more comfortable. We're going to install a plant litter. On top of this vegetable bedding, we'd place an animal skin to make the mattress of the time a little more comfortable, and then cover the body. With an enveloping fur that will get you through the freezing nights. After such a trying day, Yaleen was soon asleep. For the sake of my clan, I promise to look after you. However, Tashar had no idea how this encounter would shape his life. Two weeks have passed since the bartering session. Yaleen has integrated well into the life of the clan. She participates in all the chores without a second thought. Tashar never takes his eyes off her, looking after her as if she were his most precious possession. Today, Yaleen and the other women of the clan are by the river. Each has her own chore, and for Yaleen, it's drawing water. Cro-Magnon man needs wood, of course. He can't have huge stocks of water, so he needs to be able to replenish his supplies very easily. The budding complicity between Yaleen and Tashar hasn't escaped anyone. Especially not Lati, who seems to appreciate the situation and even enjoys it. This water was essential, as Cro-Magnon would use it, of course, for drinking. But he would also bring water back to the camps to cook. But water had to be transported, and there was no such thing as ceramics. Pottery didn't exist at that time. We know that they used pots, that they knew how to work them, how to sew them, and therefore they could use animal skins to transport water. I think hygiene had its place in this hunter-gatherer tribe. Of course, water was also essential for washing. While the clan had no shortage of water, food was in short supply, and everyone relied on Mick Lee. Fast and agile, she's the clan's best fisherwoman. In the river, Cro-Magnum will be able to find fish rich enough to provide him with vitamins, omega-3, in short, everything that is good for health today. They were already eating it. Barely had they set foot in the water, and already their first salmon. A nice catch that would make the clan happy. But to feed everyone, many more were needed. You could fish by hand. You had to be relatively quick and seasoned in this practice. You could also use other techniques. 
The assegai could be used to really get at the fish, and you could also make nasses and even nets that were braided and used to catch lots of fish. With which to catch lots of fish. A woman crosses the river to pick berries. Lati is not very reassured to see her walk away. Today we know what prehistoric man ate. Cro-Magnon was not only a carnivore, he also ate plants. He was an omnivore. There's a varied diet with fruit and probably cereals too. It's not hard to imagine that he'd go hunting for eggs. They were intelligent enough to make use of everything they could find in their environment. Since we're here, the cro had to feed well. If it fed badly, it would have disappeared sooner or later. Lottie can't help but be wary. She knows that water sources attract animals, even the most dangerous ones. And today, she has a bad feeling. Patently, when you drink, you're vulnerable. You don't pay attention to what might come from elsewhere. Predators are numerous. You can meet hyenas, lions, panthers, but the king predator is unquestionably the polar bear. Suddenly, she hears growling. Once again, her instincts were right. It's a bear. The noises are getting closer, and the animal seems very upset. We have to get out of here before it's too late. You have to imagine the cave bear standing at around two, 50 meters tall, so it's a particularly frightening animal. This time, everyone managed to escape the bear. But in the general panic, some of the fishing was abandoned. Tonight, the Tasha clan won't have enough to eat. The shaman is the only one who dares to brave the darkness. In this cave, spirits prowl, but he is not afraid. The cave itself is not just an art gallery. What's certain is that the cave is a place that was disconnected from everyday life. And when we went there, it had a symbolic importance. The bear episode shocked everyone. A woman was almost seriously injured or worse. The shaman will therefore thank the forces for sparing the women of his clan. When we venture into the bowels of the earth, when we break free from the darkness by torchlight, it's never by chance. We can imagine that it is perhaps to communicate with an afterlife, with spirits. Some people had transmissions that enabled them to make imaginary journeys of sorts, to see the scenery move inside the caves. That's what we call shamanism. Talu doesn't just want to thank the spirits for their mercy. Above all, he must ask them for help. The clan is facing a very serious threat. Food is in desperate short supply. He, the shaman, must do something. The survival of his community depends on it. We know that in the most recent hunter-gatherer peoples of North America, Siberia, and Asia, the shaman played a central role. His role was probably to protect the clan by appealing to natural divine forces of some kind so that the clan could find both food and protection. Food, but also protection from ferocious animals. Until late at night, Tell Louis will call on the divine forces. He's counting on their intervention to make the next hunt a success.
sun has just begun to shine, and Chalik has been leading a group of men and women for many hours. He leads them to a river he knows well, with a very specific objective in mind. Hunting. Hunting is one of the most important activities and not an individual one. It often mobilizes all the forces of the deep. They've come all this way because Chaleg knows that a large flock of queens comes to the same place every year. Depending on the beasts being stalked, specific tactics will be put in place. It could be the few, the chase, or the batu. It seems that men had strategies, and when they worked, they always repeated the same ones. I imagine that man must have observed other predators and imitated their methods to some extent. Chaleg is an excellent hunter. He's skillful, alert, and has a kind of sixth sense. He knows exactly where the animals will cross the river. You need to know the territory, where the animals are going to cross, and where you can corner them to kill them. He would set up in a strategic location, for example, on river fords. And so every year, they come there to kill the animals as they pass. The clan trusts Chaleg. In return, Chaleg cannot and must not let them down. Another interesting thing about hunting parties is that you have to have some kind of strategy. He planned all the hunting action, which proves that Cro-Magnon was intelligent enough to think in several stages. The idea in hunting is to spend as little time as possible, to sacrifice as little energy as possible, to take as few risks as possible. Chaleg divides the group in two. On one side, the hunters. On the other, the beaters. The clan leader feels that Tashar is still too young to accompany the hunters, so he'll be with the beaters. Tashar is disappointed, but as a small consolation, he will stay by Yelin's side. Because when the tip broke, you had to be able to change it. Chaleg leads the group of hunters. Together, they advance cautiously. The last thing they want is for the reindeer's capti. Their presence or the whole thing is ruined. The point was probably made of servid wood, flint or ivory. They were fastened with sinew and then glue or putty made, for example, by heating tree bark. The blades were tapered enough to fit over the assegais so that the animal would not be seriously wounded and would not need to be chased for too long. On the other side of the river, the raiding party, guided by Lati, set up. The trap set for the animals was closing. The women took part in the game drive, but they weren't necessarily the ones doing the killing. It seems that throwing was more of a male activity. Lati, Tasha, and Yalin have to be patient, very patient. You have to appear at the right moment to drive the herd towards the hunters. The hunter who gives the kill would be nothing without the action of the herders. The Wren's herd is exactly where Chalik had planned it. Faced with the animals, the group of Lati will wait for an animal to put its paws in the water to give the signal. Cro-Magnon hunted reindeer first and foremost, because this is an animal whose gregarious behavior makes it easy to hunt. Despite the importance of the moment, Tashar isn't very focused. He can't help watching Yalin. He's sure it's not the first time she's taken part in a hunt. Yalin, who taught you to hunt so well? Who are you, really? Chaleg's time is running out. He's nervous, but he has to stay focused. The success of a hunt depends on details.
Prehistoric hunters didn't engage in over-exploitation of game. They would simply take what they needed from nature. Nor should we fall into the trap of imagining the Garden of Eden, that prehistoric man is partly responsible for the disappearance of what we call megafauna, i.e. large animals. In Australia, Europe and America, the disappearance of these large animals coincided more or less with the arrival of modern man. The renders didn't feel the presence of the hunters. One of them steps forward and in a fraction of a second, they start screaming. Frightened, the beasts throw themselves into the water and... And unfortunately for them, head for Chaleg and the hunters. But nothing goes according to plan. Most of the herd managed to escape. The hunters only managed to hit one render. Tonight, the group returns with meager booty. There's a site where a reindeer has been hunted, butchered, and cut up between different tents. This means that the men shared the game when they returned from the hunt, if they were hunters from one of the tents who had come back empty-handed, the others passed on a piece or a few pieces of their reindeer. That's what's important. Whether you're a hunter or not, everyone has access to food. It's a group that's extremely and no one is left on the sidelines. The meat is quickly consumed, but the rest of the animal is carefully preserved. Everything in reindeer is good, and the Cro-Magnons were quick to understand this. They used the skins to protect themselves from the cold and rain and to cover their tents. They also used bones and antlers, which are particularly resistant in reindeer, to make tools and weapons. And they even used their viscera, which are fairly watertight to make containers and gourds. So when Cro-Magnons catch a reindeer, there's really no waste. In Chaleg's eyes, the incantations of Talu, the shaman, were not sufficiently successful. He would have liked to bring back many more animals. When you bring in big game, you need to develop techniques to preserve the meat over the long term. We could smoke the meat, which is a bit like our dried meat today. We could also store it in large silos dug into the earth. Because thanks to glacial temperatures, in the end, prehistoric man invented the first freezing system. Chaleg is worried. He wonders if he's losing his gift for hunting. But above all, this semi-failure could call into question his authority. This morning, Tashar can't stop thinking about his mother. Ever since the bear episode and the perilous hunting expedition, he's been afraid for her. If anything happened to her, he'd be inconsolable. So he made a decision, and when he sat down opposite the stonemason, he made a special request. There were people of varying skill levels. In some sites, we found objects that were moderately well made, not bad, but not much better. And it was assumed that these might be young people, young people in the process of learning. There must have been a transmission of knowledge, perhaps not from teachers like today, but in any case from adult people who had mastered a technique and passed it on to the children. Tasha carefully selected a piece of bone. He had a precise idea of what he wanted to do with it, to make a necklace that could protect Lati from evil spirits. He needs his mentor's teaching concepts. There are different ways of transmitting through the repetition of gestures, not necessarily through language. For me, they had the same capacity for language exchange and communication as we do. At the old man's side, Tashar not only learns to carve and model, he also became more patient and persevering. To make the right gestures, he repeats those of his model over and over again. Some stonemasons were so gifted that they made objects that are impossible to reproduce today. They became true engineers of prehistory, true experts in stone cutting.
Unperturbed, the stonecutter cuts his flint block with an ease that forces Tashar to admire him. If only he had his know-how. In Cro-Magnon times, some 200 stone tools were known to have been made, and some even had different functions. There's the scraper, used to work skins, which is used to scrape skins to soften them, and also to remove hair. Another common tool is the knife. It can be a simple blade, and sometimes even a spine, as on today's knives, so that you can cut and press your finger without cutting yourself. Tashar is a rather gifted student, but Yalin's arrival distracts him. His mentor smiles. He says nothing and gets back to work. The sound of his firing pin is enough to call Tasha to order. There are at least two main types of firing pin. Hard ones made of stone and soft ones made of wood, which are used to roughen objects and remove large splinters. What was to revolutionize stone cutting in the Cro-Magnon era was the so-called flexible striker, made of wren wood, for example, which enabled the edges of blades to be cut more finely or to carve what are known as laurel leaves, which are very, very fine stone leaves. These admirable objects are so fine that you can put them in front of a light source and see the light through. Once Yelin had left, Tashar went back to work. And the necklace to protect his mother from evil spirits is making good progress. The Cro-Magnons are making objects they will need on a daily basis. But we've also noticed that some objects seem to be purely artistic. These objects are sometimes finely chiseled with a marked aesthetic research. We found ornaments made from bird feathers. Bird feathers, shells, wolf teeth and fox teeth. Tashar has completed the talizing. Lati's gift is ready. This desire to make something beautiful is the wish to make different things that aren't useful, that aren't essential. Useful, that aren't indispensable, but that give pleasure. By giving Lati this necklace, Tasha hopes it will make her invincible. Will the spirits prove him right? risen over the camp. Almost everyone is already hard at work. Tashar gets up a little later than usual. Right away, he notices something unusual. Yalin has disappeared. Where is she? It's not her habit to wander off. Tashar has a bad feeling about this. He sets out to find her. He has to hurry. He must find her before Chalik realizes she's gone. Was there really an elected or institutionalized leader? Very, very unlikely. It's more likely that someone stood out from the crowd and that his decisions were accepted and validated by the rest of the group. Yaline, Yaline, Yaline! When Tashar returns empty-handed, Chaleg quickly understands the situation. How could Tashar have been so careless? If Yalin has run away, it's entirely his fault. Tashar accepts the admonition without flinching. He's overwhelmed by a feeling of doubt. Shalek takes matters into his own hands and sends the clan out in search of Yalin. Tashar still wants to believe. He hopes it's not too late. Living in a group means responding to norms, rules, and codes. To break these rules, betraying the law of the clan can lead to sanctions and punishment. Despite a search, there was no trace of Yalin. Worst case scenario. 
Could she have been attacked by a predator or had a bad fall? Yalin! The more time passed, the more we had to face the facts. Yalin had disappeared. This infuriates Chaleg. His trust has been betrayed by Tashar. He was responsible for Yalin and failed to keep an eye on her. Tashar is unforgivable. When you broke the rules, especially when something serious happened, you had to suffer the consequences. Chaleg announces the sentence. Tashar is excluded from the clan. All around the chief, there is incomprehension. The punishment was very heavy, but above all, Chaleg had taken this decision alone without consulting anyone, which was not his custom. At the time, there was a dynamic that enabled people to make joint decisions. In this group, men or women with a certain charisma probably emerged. These people can take an ascendancy over others. Perhaps the elders also had more say than the others. Chaleg sets the rules. If Tashar finds Yalin safe and sound, he can return to camp. Lati is shaken. She pleads with the clan chief for mercy, but to no avail. Chaleg remains deaf to her pleas. We can try to look at what happens in today's nomadic societies, and we can assume, a priori, as these are not very hierarchical societies, that these were rather collective decisions in which men and women took part. Collective decisions involving both men and women. Chaleg's decision to inflict this punishment on the young man was not without considerable risk. The young man's life could be at stake. What is he trying to prove by imposing such an ordeal? As for Lati, she can't accept Chaleg's decision. She's so angry she could kill him with her bare hands. When Talu intervenes to calm Lati down, he is also puzzled. Tashar is obviously a good boy, courageous, skillful, and a good hunter in the future. Completely distraught, Tashar left the camp in a hurry. He took nothing with him, neither weapons nor food. It's in the worst possible conditions that he faces his destiny. When Tashar finds himself on his own, he is faced with perhaps the greatest challenge he has ever faced. Will he be able to make fire on his own? It's not certain. He has to be able to hunt and feed himself. He must also be able to protect and cover himself because he knows how to work with skins. Tasha doesn't have many survival skills, it seems to me, because many of his activities were collective. Tasha is far from imagining what lies ahead, all the obstacles he'll have to overcome and the dangers he'll face. It's the eternal rule, eat or be eaten. A man with no defenses, no horns, nor Claus is helpless against a lion or a hyena. Suddenly a noise. Tashar barely has time to hide. And then his heart races when he realizes it's Lati. Maternal instinct was the strongest. Lati didn't hesitate to defy Chaleg's ban. Chaleg's ban to see her son one last time. She gives him food for a few days, even though she knows it's not much. Loneliness is something absolutely terrible. When you're deprived of the support of the group, it means you'll have to fend for yourself in everything. Poor Tashar, if he doesn't find another human group to take him in, he's doomed sooner or later. Lati asks her son for one last favor. She made him promise to meet Talu before leaving. The shaman doesn't appreciate Chaleg's attitude. He will not hesitate to protect Tashar from evil spirits. Lati is overcome by a wave of sadness as she watches her son slip away. Will she ever see him again? Every minute of her life becomes a challenge to survival. Tashar resumes his walk. 
dark thoughts overwhelm him. Why was Chaleg so hard on him? It's not like him. Does he have a personal grudge against him? Talu is deep in meditation. The old sage is surely Tasha's last hope. The one who can put him on Yalin's trail. On Yalin's trail. But he's also close to Chaleg. So, will he agree to help the young man? Whether he's a sorcerer, healer, or shaman, what's important is to observe that there are individuals. Individuals in these clans who, because of their advanced age and wisdom, will be able to play the role of transmitter, of go-between. Tashar is cautious. He doesn't know what kind of welcome the shaman will give him. We can imagine that, within a clan, certain people who had the confidences of others could act as mediators in case of conflict. Mediate in conflicts between people. In the end, Talu shows no hostility. Quite the contrary, in fact. Talu's advice to him is based above all on his human values. Talu will pass on things to Tashar that may have almost a philosophical value, as we would say today, but are in fact advice to help him grow. Tashar listens attentively to Talu, but has to face the facts. The shaman doesn't know where Yalin is. The young man feels he can only rely on himself. It's time to set off. But Talu holds Tashar back. He has something to give him. It's what will enable him to hunt, feed and defend himself against predators. So his life depends on this object. This weapon is the only thing that could possibly give him a chance of survival. Back on the road, questions give way to anguish. He's alone now, really alone. What Tashar doesn't yet suspect is that the adventure he's about to embark on will turn him into someone else. Tashar wanders the step like a damned man. Disorientated, he has found no clues to Yelene's whereabouts. Tired and hungry, he needs to regain his strength quickly. But his attempts are in vain. You can't improvise. Expert handling of his watch is the fruit of a long apprenticeship involving both observation and repetition of gestures. Weakened, Tashar lacks vigilance and overlooks all traps, but even the most obvious ones. Tashar's journey could have ended fatally at the foot of this cliff. Tashar has no choice. If he's to survive, he'll absolutely have to find something to eat. A few berries will do for now. The primate's advantage over other animals is that it can see the color red, for example. So, Cro-Magnon can see the color red. I think this ability allows us to identify berries, to identify fruit more effectively. Tashar's attention is drawn to a vulture circling in the sky. This scavenger is not there by chance. He must have spotted an animal carcass. Instinctively, the teenager lets the bird guide him. Tashar is determined. He's not going to let the bird of prey take away his chance to eat some meat, even if it is a bit pheasant-like. Cro-Magnon was clearly an opportunist. He knew how to grab his prey where it was. And sometimes carrion can be a welcome feast. You don't have to waste energy to kill the beast. 
This is further proof that our ancestors knew how to exploit the resources available to them in the best possible way. The need to eat drove them to this type of easily accessible food. We have gradually learned to hunt larger and larger beasts with, with increasingly sophisticated weapons. Tashar has to move fast. He has to find the beast before the vulture does. Motivated as ever, he manages to scare off his rival. The hare is a meager booty, but he'll eat his fill. And for the first time, he has succeeded in conquering this hostile nature. On the step, the sun is waning. Tashar pauses and wonders. Where could Yalin be? Then a doubt assails him. What if she left of her own free will? Was I wrong to trust her? Could Yalin betray me? Reality soon catches up with Tashar. He absolutely had to find shelter for the night. Finally, he finds a safe place where he can enjoy his first real meal since his exclusion. In his wanderings, Tashar finds refuge behind a large boulder, a temporary shelter. He'll be able to take shelter, which means he won't have any animals coming up behind him. The first thing to do when choosing a bivouac is to build a fire. Tashar has seen his clan make fire dozens of times, so he knows exactly what to do. Today, thanks to archaeology, we know that ancient man mastered fire at least 400 zero years ago, so Tashar knows how to make fire. Tashar has two methods of lighting his fire, percussion and friction. He opts for percussion, not two flints percussed against each other, but flint against pyrite which will generate hot sparks. And then we'll take these little embers, put them on zoo or dried herbs. We'll blow on them and create flames. With the first flames, Tashar regains a glimmer of hope. A little comfort in this lonely, wandering world. Our ancestors were the first to understand the benefits of heat radiation. It's no coincidence that small stone circles are always found around the livers. These stones store heat in order to release it more effectively. If we look at the technical capabilities of these men of the past and compare them, for example, with my own, I'd be inclined to say that a crow magnon had the same intellectual capacities as I do today. The long-awaited moment has finally arrived. Tashar can now enjoy the catch of the day. Eating butchered meat without cooking it is a real danger. Tashar knows that cooking the meat will protect him. Men and women will instinctively learn to cook meat, which will act as a veritable shield against parasites and other intestinal diseases. Once full, Tashar enjoys the warmth of the fire, this pleasant sensation which he had almost forgotten reminds him of the 12 moments he spent with his family. He misses clan life and his mother above all. Man became independent of the cycle of day and night. Man could stay up late and around the fire indeed people warmed up. Meat was cooked, and as in all human societies, tongues were loosened and people talked. Songs were invented, stories told, and myths created. He'd give anything to have his life back. But he has to admit, he has no idea where Yalin is. He needs a plan. Despite his fatigue, Tasha fights sleep. He's once again afraid of being. Nightmares, always the same ones.
Since Tashar's departure, the complicity between Lati and Chaleg has been shattered. The grieving mother carefully avoids the man who caused her unhappiness. Aware of this malaise, Chaleg wants to try and put things right. To Homo sapiens sapiens, he's a being who resembles us. Even if he seems a long way off, Cro-Magnon had feelings. They were sensitive men like you and me. They felt joy, sadness, guilt, and pride. Things that are common to all mankind. Lati considers Chaleg to be an unforgivable man. No one can make her smile again, least of all him. He deeply disgusts her. When Chaleg tries to explain himself, Lati can no longer contain her hatred and rage. He broke up her family. She's going to make him pay. It's possible that the camps themselves were made up of extended families, but under canvas. You really get the impression that these are nuclear families, so monopoly parental or not, I don't know, but in any case, small groups of people. The man, the woman, the uncle, and the child. The uncle being the wife's brother. That's the basic family unit. The attempt at reconciliation quickly turned into a fist fight. In front of the clan members, Chaleg suffers another setback. The chief learns the hard way what a mother is capable of when her son is taken from her. In prehistoric times, there was no such thing as an exclusive model. There must have been groups of individuals who practiced polygamy and others who practiced monogamy. Some believe that man is not naturally monogamous and that he tends to go elsewhere to have as many offspring as possible. This new public affront further undermines Chaleg's authority. He feels increasingly alone. He begins to realize that Tashar's exclusion has done him considerable harm. Tashar, for his part, has no respite and is having more and more bad encounters. Once again, he escapes in extremis. To brave a thousand dangers, to feed on berries and carrion, to travel miles and miles without seeing a single water hole, Tashar is on the verge of giving up. He has the feeling that Yaline has disappeared without a trace. Unless, without looking, he is drawn to a detail. Men have been there. It's a certainty. Tashar is going to call on one of the skills he learned from his elders. That of a tracker. He'll start observing little details around him, perhaps trampled grass, broken branches, little things that will give him an indication of a passageway that's been passed. Him the indication of a passage that, for the time being, would not be that of an animal, but perhaps of several humans. No member of his clan has ever thrown his sage so far. How is this possible? It would be thanks to this small piece of wood. What Tashar has just discovered is the propeller, a revolutionary tool invented by Homo sapiens 20 zero years ago. It's an extraordinary instrument because it extends the strength of the arm, multiplying the weapon's penetration power and increasing its effectiveness. Penetration power and throw distance. The thruster is to hunting what the rod is to fishing. When fishing, you'll cast much harder and much farther when you use a rod. 
then when you throw the hook and line directly by hand. With the thruster, it's the same. You get what's called leverage. No matter how hard Tashar tries, he just doesn't understand how to use this strange stick. For him, it's all about magic. What if these hunters are sorcerers? Maybe they're dangerous. He then remembers with horror stories heard at camp in the evenings around the fire. Men were said to have incredible strength because they ate human flesh. We know that certain tribes ate other human beings, probably for ritual purposes. Cannibalism was practiced during funeral ceremonies when, for example, a piece of the deceased's brain or heart was removed to appropriate both his spiritual qualities and his courage. Completely absorbed by this discovery, Tashar forgets all caution and fails to see the danger coming. Before long, his assailant has the upper hand. Tashar is taken prisoner. Back at camp, Tachar expects the worst. They can't convince themselves that they're simply re-inder hunters. For all we know, this meat is a piece of man. Tashar is about to find out. He has been signaled to sit down and share the meal. The wait seems interminable. Beyond the base camp, where the clan may settle for long weeks or even months, there are also temporary camps. From this low camp, people set off to make bivouacs or to collect raw materials to make tools or meat. They're really hunting stops. You find a small fire, you find a few bones from a single animal. So they really only stayed a few hours. Watching them closely, Tasha doesn't find them particularly belligerent. And that woman preparing the meal has the same gestures and attitude as her mother. Hot stones were placed in a small pot, producing a fairly hot liquid in which to boil the meat. In which to boil meat, for example. Then the food would be put inside, probably plants gathered from around the house, a few pieces of meat, even some marrow water to give the broth consistency. My imagination must be playing tricks on me. No, this is reindeer meat. Tasha soon realizes that he's not a prisoner, but a guest of his reindeer hunters. Over dinner, tongues start to wag. Tashar recounts his incredible adventure, but he's only too eager to find out more about the strange piece of wood that can throw a sledgehammer over the hills. The hunters keep nothing from him. They reveal all the secrets of the thruster. There's no point in possessing the thruster technique alone. You have to help others survive too. There's no shortage of game, and space is so vast that it can easily be shared. If you want to perpetuate humanity, you have to accumulate knowledge and pass it on. For a few moments, the young man forgot his worries. An enchanted interlude that would not last. His encounter with the hunters triggered something in Tashar. It restored his confidence. Since then, he has followed Yaleen's trail without the slightest feeling of fatigue, as if carried along by a new momentum. And then one day, luck seemed to smile on him again. He sees something lying on the ground, a gourd. When a hunter goes on an expedition, or for a few days, he carries a gourd. 
These gourds made it possible to carry a certain quantity of liquid with you when you traveled inland. You have to imagine Tunra's gigantic plains of grass, there isn't water everywhere. And if he loses it, it becomes a real danger to his survival. Tasha recognizes this gourd without a moment's hesitation. It's Yalin's. This gourd didn't fall there by chance. Tashar is convinced that Yalin deliberately left a clue. If his intuition is right, it means she's been kidnapped. But by whom? And for what purpose? One thing's for sure, she's in danger. The idea that something bad could happen to Yalin upsets Tashar. He's overcome by a new feeling. Has he fallen in love? Tashar and Yalin have clearly formed an emotional bond. It's a bond that can certainly be found at many moments in humanity's long history. The strength of Homo sapiens lies in its ability to open up to others, to go out and meet others, and this has given rise to interbreeding, which has only strengthened the human race. Which has only strengthened the diversity of the species. Will Yalin want to stay in my clan? How can I explain to her how I feel? The notion of interbreeding is fundamental to the definition of humanity. Interbreeding will certainly ensure the survival of human groups by bringing in new biological traits. The young man had a question. Does Yalin share his feelings? When modern man emerged from Africa, he was probably dark-skinned perhaps with a little frizzy hair and a lot of hair. Hair and was quite tall. Then, depending on the climate, in Europe the skin became lighter. It's this interbreeding that makes us what we are today. No more dreaming. Yalin can't be far away. Tashar must resume his quest. And when he succeeds, He'll show Chaleg that he's a man now. The thought of the clan leader revulses him. He still doesn't understand why he was treated so harshly. After a few days, Lati's health deteriorates. She grew weaker and weaker, as if the absence of her smooth son were eating away at her from the inside. Chaleg is worried to see her like this. The Cro-Magnon organism had little in common with our own. It was much more resistant, but even so it could catch diseases, particularly intestinal diseases linked to bacteria or parasites that could be consumed in meat. of the plants they used as medicines. For Lady, it was all too much. His last strength deserted him. Chaleg is the first to come to his aid, not just because he's the clan leader or because he wants to make amends, but because Lati means so much to him, far more than most people realize. For Cro-Magnon Man, there was probably this capacity to help and support the most fragile people so that they would be able to survive, so that they could live longer. There are also cases of disabled people who could not have survived without the help of their fellow human beings. In this case, the solidarity of the group is quite remarkable. Lati's state of health is really worrying. Chaleg has no choice but to call Talu, who is at the patient's bedside. Talu! Lati, please! Talu! The shaman is closest to the forces of nature. He knows what is evil, he knows what is good, and he knows how to make the most of it to heal his fellow man. It's likely that some members of the clan had acquired medicinal knowledge. They knew how to provide care. The men had a knowledge of human anatomy and knew how to repair injured people. There are cases of fractures that have been reduced. Will Talu's powers be up to the task? 
From now on, Lati's life depends on the shaman's incantations. Tashar has been hoping to find Yaline for weeks. Now his patience and determination will finally be rewarded. There's no doubt there's a bivouac. Tashar advances step by step. The last thing he wants is to be spotted. Despite the darkness, he spots a woman. It's Yaline, all right. She's tied up and looks weak. And those two kidnappers don't look very friendly. I got to get her out of there. But how? The Cro Magnon is a man, which means he's neither good nor bad. In some cases, he can be very violent, and in others, extremely peaceful. The territory is vast enough to feed everyone, so there's no reason for conflict. And the few very rare cases where individuals injured by weapons, it can be either hunting accidents or individual settling of scores. Alone against these two brutes, Tashar doesn't stand a chance. Fortunately, he has an idea. To do so, he calls on his memories. When hunting, Chaleg and his men managed to trap animals that were much stronger and more numerous than they were. Tasha had to be quick. Cro-Magnon never developed the tools to kill his fellow man. He's not a warrior. The strategies used to trap a man are the same as those used to kill a man. To track a beast in a hunting party. Tashar has spent the night preparing his trap. Now he's ready for action. Yelin's kidnappers are behaving like thick-headed bullies. To punish Yelin for losing her gourd, he prevents her from drinking. Tashar is drunk with rage, but he restrains himself. Above all, he mustn't give in to his impulses or his plan will fall apart. First part of the plan, attract the attention of the two warriors by provoking them. These can be artificial traps dug by the man himself. Pits, for example, into which the game will fall. Or take advantage of the relief of large natural avenues into which mammoths or bison are thrown. The effect is immediate. He rushes in without thinking. The rest of the plan unfolds exactly as Tasha had imagined. He leads his pursuers precisely where he wants them to go. Tasha must not fall, or the two brutes will show him no mercy. As he approaches his trap, it's the moment of truth. The hole Tashar has found is just the right size. He lets the two men live, knowing they won't be getting out anytime soon. By the time they manage to extricate themselves from this trap, Tashar and Yalin will be long gone. Captivity has been a hard ordeal for Yaline. Tashar has to carry her, and their walk is considerably slowed down. The young man is nervous. He wants to put the kidnappers at a safe distance. The hole may be deep. They'll eventually come out and come after them. In the meantime, Tasha has to take care of Yalin. He'll be able to put to good use what his clan members taught him. They knew their environment very well. It was knowledge that had been passed down from generation to generation. It's knowing how to recognize the slightest poison, knowing which plants are likely to be able to cure you, that will enable Tasha to rescue Yalin. The Cro-Magnons had discovered that chewing bark or soil leaves calmed pain and fever. 
The road back to camp is still long and hard, and Yaline really needs a rest. Tashar is in a hurry to get back, but he's wise and decides to stay by the lake. He takes advantage of this break to get down to work. He has a very precise idea. Using his memory, he tries to reproduce that magical object he's been so captivated by, a thruster. He took his time. He'll do it as many times as it takes. As many times as it takes, but he manages to build his thruster. As he shapes it, he senses that this discovery could change his life, and that of his clan. The thruster was often made of servid wood, sometimes ivory, and was quite a prestigious object. There are some absolutely magnificent thrusters that are ornately carved. The end of the thruster on which the assegai is fixed is transformed into an animal head, the head of a fox or buffalo. As Yalin gradually recovers, she notices that Tashar has changed. He's more mature, more sure of himself. In every situation and every gesture, she now sees a man. Each thruster reflects the personality of the hunter to whom it belongs. As a hunter is sometimes superstitious, perhaps decorating it makes it more effective. Not everything is sacred. Men like to personalize their weapons and tools. It could be that too. Time to get back on the road. Yaline now feels safe with Tashar. Yaline and Tasha have been walking for several moons. The girl is now fully recovered. As they approach the camp, the clan dog is the first to greet them, a soothing presence. Before rejoining her family, Tasha wanted to make a slight detour. is here, near the cave. The shaman doesn't seem surprised to see Tashar and Yaline again. There are two main reasons why the young man wanted to see him first. He wants to thank him for his help and advice. But above all, he wants to know the latest news from the clan, or more precisely, the state of mind of Chaleg. Will he keep his promise? Will he be able to erase the mistakes of the past? As usual, the shaman doesn't answer directly. Instead, he invites her to follow him. As he makes his way into the darkness behind you. Loot, Tashar discovers a wondrous world he never knew existed. In Europe, around 30,000 years ago, man went underground to draw on the walls. There are a number of paintings, most of which depict animals. Not just any animals, but a selection of animals from the environment. Bison, horses, reinders, and sometimes even felines. In some regions, mammoths or deer. Thank you, Talu. I'm honored. Tasha is dazzled by such beauty. He takes full advantage of the moment and feels the strength emanating from this astonishing place. You can see that the Cro-Magnons really thought this place through. They observed the walls and tried to reproduce the equivalent of movement. When you look at it a certain way, they used the asperities of the rocks to reproduce the volume of an animal. It was also breathtaking to see their mastery of color Manganese, charcoal, ochre. Those who drew on the cave walls were professionals. 
We noticed, for example, that there were extremely similar styles from one cave to another, which suggests that there was a link between the artists. Perhaps there were schools with styles that were perpetuated. Tashar admires Talu's work. The shaman still impresses him. It's quite possible that the caves are just the tip of Lisburg, and that in fact, there was an abundance of art outside. Since the 80s, we've known that the cliffs were decorated with engravings. So we have to imagine that prehistoric man, prehistoric man lived amidst a wealth of images. Tashar freezes for a moment in front of the representation of a woman and can't help thinking of his mother. He can't wait to see her again. It's been so long. Humans are represented in another form. The famous little female statuettes are abundant. They're called prehistoric Venuses. They're very recognizable, often very curvaceous, with generous breasts and strong hips, in a way a sign of fertility and fecundity. Tashar is not at the end of his surprises. Talu suggests a very strange ritual some caves are extremely difficult to access. The caves may have been places of initiation where young children were taken to learn the history of the group and become adults. Talu will perform a kind of rite of passage to symbolize this moment. Tasha has survived this dangerous journey and brought Yalin back safe and sound. For Talu, he deserves to be honored. It's also a way of diverting the young man's attention. Ever since he entered this magical world, Tashar hasn't asked about the clan, which suits the shaman just fine. In the meantime, the cave will forever bear the imprint of this extraordinary young man. Moved by the ritual, Tashar needs to come to his senses. Talu has given him no answers. He dreads the moment when he will meet Chaleg again and face the chief's gaze. But he has nothing to reproach himself for. He returns to the camp with Yalin. When they arrive, Tashar and Yalin don't understand. The camp is deserted. What's going on? Where's my mother? In the distance, the sound of a tambourine breaks the silence. They used musical instruments. One of the oldest was called the ronde. It consisted of an object that was twirled, the sound of the wind. But they also used animal bones, which they pierced to make flutes or hides to make drums. To make drums, giving rise to the first percussion instruments. Guided by the music, Yalin and Tashar stumble into the middle of a ceremony. It's a funeral. Archaeological evidence shows that the Cro-Magnons buried their dead, or at least some of them. Bodies are buried in individual graves, but there are also collective burials, often facing northeast, where the sun rises. The notion of a cemetery was perhaps already emerging at this time. Around a hundred burials were found over the entire period. This suggests that there were other funerary practices, but which have left no trace, such as cremation. From a distance, Tashar can make out the imposing silhouette of Chaleg. He is the master of ceremonies. When he raises a necklace with a few shells, with a few shells he feels a shock. Even within these tombs, there are disparities. There are tombs with absolutely incredible, absolutely incredible, extraordinary, with an enormous amount of ornamentation. Bracelets, leggings, sometimes ochre on the skin, tattoos, so many artifices that accompanied the deceased in death.
This necklace is the one he gave to his mother, and in the earth, it's Lottie's body. Lifeless. Tashar is devastated. Ravaged by grief. Why you? Why now? Tashar is devastated. Lati must have left, thinking her son hadn't survived his exclusion. Powerless in the face of the young man's suffering, Talu resumes the course of the ceremony. Ochre can perhaps symbolize blood, the vital flow, but it can also be used because it has sanitizing properties. Tashar can't stand seeing Chaleg lift his mother's necklace. Unable to stand it any longer, he snatches it out of her hands. It's up to him, his son, to make the offerings, but especially not to that traitor Chalej, who failed to look after his mother. A person buried with many objects is not necessarily a very rich or important person. Above all, she was a loved one. Tashar arrived too late. This gesture is the last thing he can do for his mother. We don't know whether he believed in a divine world, an afterlife in which the dead could circulate. We can only assume that some of these objects may have been in some way a token of peace for the deceased arriving in the afterlife. The music disappeared, leaving Tashar alone in his grief. Yalin's presence changes nothing. But sadness gradually gives way to anger. Chaleg is responsible for all this. He intends to make him pay. Calm in the clan lasted only a short time after Leti's funeral. Once again, the lack of food is at the heart of the discussions. Chaleg advocates caution. He believes that small game will suffice. There's no point in taking risks by hunting. Animals that are too fast and, above all, too dangerous. Tashar intervenes. He has the solution. With his piece of wood and his propeller, he can safely reach any animal. The hunters are perplexed. Chaleg doesn't appreciate Tashar's nerve at all. A leader is someone who is able to make decisions, to impose himself as a guide for the rest of the group. It's just the ability to lead others. All it takes is for one member of the clan to perform a heroic deed, and all of a sudden he's carried into the light and everything changes. But this role is not one that is legally established or politicized. Usually discreet in such situations, Talu steps in, if Tashar claims that he can work. Miracles with his thruster let him prove it. For the young man, the moment of truth has arrived. The teenager who was excluded from the clan no longer exists. Today, Tashar is a man. He has trained hard to master the thruster. Thanks to this object, he's convinced he's become a better hunter than Chaleg. The sledgehammer can reach speeds of up to 100 kilonauts reich, and you can imagine being able to pierce the bark of a tree, for example. This radically changed hunting habits for the Cro-Magnons. Obviously, faced with such a revolutionary new hunting technique, one can imagine that the clan is a little dubious. For his demonstration, Tashar chooses a very remote tree. Chaleg is fed up with the young man's arrogance. He's been too lenient in accepting him back into the clan. If he wants to make a fool of himself, so be it. Tashar has no room for error. He has to prove to Chaleg that he's telling the truth, that his thruster is magic. Char has 
taken to confiding in Talu since his mother's funeral. He's felt an anger growing inside him and he knows the cause. It's Chaleg. It's probably his fault that Lati died of grief. Talu explains that Chaleg took care of his mother until her last breath. It's no use. Tashar is thirsty for revenge. The shaman senses that the young man is not listening. Within a clan, certain people, perhaps older ones in particular, who had the confidences of others, could serve as mediators. In the event of a conflict between several people, how to avoid a confrontation? Others Talu knew well Chaleg. His pride took a hit when Tashar demonstrated his thruster. So Talu plays his last trump card. He asks Tashar for a favor out of respect for him. Let him go and find the clan chief in peace. For the answer to all Tashar's, Tashar's questions are around Chalad's neck. Another riddle. Tashar loses patience. For a short time, Tashar puts aside his resentment. He concentrates on a new mission to teach the hunters the art of using the thruster properly. Today, when a new object arrives in our daily lives, it always takes us a little over 10 years to master it. Well, 20, zero years ago, in prehistoric times, it must have been the same. When the thruster arrived in the Tashar clan, it was a revolution. cro great strength was his ability to adapt, to change things, to improve his objects. Standing back, Chaleg observes out of the corner of his eye. He doesn't appreciate the importance the young man is taking on within the clan, although he must admit that Tasha may well have the makings of a future leader. Hesitantly, Yalin finds the right words to make Chaleg put aside his pride. The clan must remain united. Tasha is reluctant to share his knowledge of the thruster with Chaleg. But to please Yalin, he agrees. He takes the opportunity to stare at the chief's necklace for a brief moment. What is Talu? It's up to you to make me understand. Seeing the chief grasp his necklace, Tasha thinks he's figured out where the point of his Asagai comes from. The two elements together form one. So it was Chaleg Zasagai. Tashar is at a loss. Why had the one he had condemned also given him the means to survive? Talu's words echoed in his head. Chaleg's had been close to Lati and had always looked after her, perhaps more than the other women in the clan. So Chaleg is my father? Women know who their children are because they're born of them. Men may have more doubts about their paternity. They know enough about the link between the sexual act and birth. Now, did we know who the father was? That depends on the practice. Were women faithful to their partners or not? We don't know that at all. Lati took her secret to her grave. Whatever the truth, Tashar looks at Chaleg differently. His reluctance has disappeared. For his part, Chaleg is proud to have such a courageous... ...to be able to count on such a courageous, clever, and determined man. Tashar is the son he always wanted. Life returns to normal at the camp, but much has changed. And this is just the beginning. If Tashar could imagine what the world has become, he'd be extremely surprised. Everything is so different. The cities, the industry, today's digital world. 
and yet everything we are comes from Tasha's legacy. He bequeathed to us an ability to adapt, to imagine and to transform the world around us. As for Tashar, while his experience has taught him a lot about himself, it has also given him the desire to discover other horizons, to discover new horizons.